everyone i hope uh, i am audible and my screen is visible yeah you are audible and visible yes good thank you very much sir uh, the honorable vice chancellor has joined the event thank you very much ma'am this is something which is really uh, uh, very interesting and incredible event that we are doing today two of our resource persons mr shyam khandekar and professor vinayak bhadne are currently sitting in the netherlands and usa while we are organizing this event in new delhi so basically the uh, three parts of the world have come together for this event and uh, this cannot be any interesting more interesting that under these present uh, covid circumstances uh, we are uh, meeting our responsibilities our professional obligations and uh, the world has in a way become more smaller by the online medium and we can interact and we can still share and we can still build upon the knowledge that the that is being generated across the world so without much ado I will request uh, Professor Henazia, the head of the department, to kindly deliver her welcome address. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nisar. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Okay. Uh, so, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever. Uh, I'm aware of people have joined from far across, and as mentioned by Dr. Nisar, that this is an incredible moment for all of us, uh, making use of this uh, new medium and opportunity. Uh, so, as uh, Professor Akhtar, Akhtar mentions, often mentions that we should make use of uh, uh, opportunity in every uh, dark situation, even if it comes. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Jamie Malia Slami and Professor Najma Akhtar, uh, Professor Sam Akhtar, Dean, Faculty of Architecture and Acoustics, uh, Mr. Shyam Khan Dekar Ji, uh, renowned uh, senior urban designer and policy maker, author, director, My Livable City, uh, working in India, Netherlands. I mean, that's the base, but she's all across. Uh, Professor Vinayak Barney, uh, Associate Professor of Urbanism, uh, University of South California, Los Angeles. Uh, it's uh, indeed a great pleasure for all of us to hold this event uh, in an online mode, and that's the reason why we could connect uh, simultaneously uh, three parts of the world to release a, a much-awaited book, especially uh, for our department, which is known for its uh, unique course on urban regeneration. Uh, the book is. Uh, on sustainable design through upcycling. Uh, this comes at a very opportune time when uh, the world is gasping to reduce the GAG emissions and escape the vagaries of extreme climate events. And uh, uh, in today's uh, world, when we are many countries, uh, we are returning towards circularity in many sectors and repurposing the existing available resources. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is what, it, it's a wonderful attempt. It has come at the right moment. I think there is a dearth, dearth of uh, case studies and effective uh, collated stories and na narratives to look forward to. So uh, uh, it's, it's a, indeed a matter of delight and honor. Uh, a very glorious moment to extend my warm wishes on behalf of uh, Jamia Milia Islamia and the Department of Architecture to everyone present here. And I want to convey my heartfelt uh, gratitude to the Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Ma'am, Professor Najma Akhtar, for accepting the invitation uh, to this book launch in India of Designing for Sustainability Through Recycling by uh, Shyam Khandekarji with essays from Professor Vinayak Bharane. Uh, Ma'am has always been very, very supportive for all our efforts, small, big, uh, whatever may be, and she's always there. So thank you, Madam, for uh, for always uh, pushing us to reach newer heights. Uh, designing for sustainability through upcycling, it uh, tells the uh, nearly three decades long inside story of how policies were made, uh, decisions taken, designs created, how the projects developed in uh, phases and how the city governments partnered with the private sector in a very unique manner uh, based on a successful brownfield projects in the Netherlands, the uh, Palace uh, Wister, um, I don't know how to pronounce it well, but that's that's very, very uh, famous project. This book offers first-hand information of 30 years of development as uh, 
told by master planner uh, shyam khandekar ji and professor vinayak bharne uh, professor vinayak bharne places the process of upcycling in the context of development from other parts of the world uh, i'm extremely thankful uh, to shyam khandekar ji and professor bharne for the presence uh, we all are uh, very eagerly looking forward to your interesting talk on this theme and i'm sure all the students faculty members and practitioners who have joined us today uh, will really benefit a lot from this talk and there's a lot of uh, key takeaways from the talk as as well as the book uh, thank you once again everyone for uh, making your time to be here and uh, uh, participating in this uh, event thank you so much thank you very much ma'am uh, now may i request professor asim akhtar the dean of the faculty of architecture and acoustics to please uh, say a few words sir good morning uh, to vc sir ma'am and to our guest and the friends it's a good opportunity that our academic family is together in spite of all the distances across the globe we are sitting but today we are together in for this occasion and especially with the sham khandekar Uh, i have met him a few years back and number of times and we had a good interaction also so i salute his passion for publication and for academic works he is pursuing with a lot of vigor from many years and i had the opportunity to write two issue for two issues of his publication my uh, livable city that is a very good publication and in october uh, 16 and april 7 uh, 17 i published it there contributed to major articles and they are now landmark architects they are often referred even today almost is a five years but they are being referred as a seminal work a lot of students and teachers are referring that those both both of them they are very comprehensive and i appreciate that i that uh, shyam did the initiative to force me to write that and he published that and that is i think a more uh, reference point and that is there available and he is doing lot of work his passion for publication is very great regularly he was publishing now he is coming out with the book which will be again a very good reference point for many students of planning and architecture so it's i appreciate all the efforts done by you know, both the speaker speaker sir and the friends who are like a family to academic family who are together we, we often meet together alok ranjan and others are there so it's great opportunity we are together again sitting again and we are uh, even in spite of covid situation and pandemic in, um, spread over all over the globe we are moving ahead in our in academic endeavors and we are contributing and exchanging the education uh, and the knowledge about the planning and the cities that is the most challenging issues nowadays but still uh, we are on the forefront runner in spreading that mental and taking that mental of expanding the education for planning and architecture so it's great we now occasion we are here thank you i will not take much time i will give the rest of the time for shyam and vici ma'am to uh, say few words on this comment on this and put their experience with us thank you thank you very much sir uh, now uh, with the permission of Uh, Professor Najma Akhtar, the Honorable Vice Chancellor Jamia Mirza Islamia, may I request that we can launch the book uh, online, ma'am? Please do the honors of on launching the book, ma'am. I'll I'll just show the screen so that the book is considered to be launched. Okay. Thank Please you very much, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you very much, ma'am. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, it is. Thank you, ma'am. This is the front cover of the book, and with this, we consider the book to be launched for for India. This is the back cover of the book. The book is published in. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Vici, ma'am. The book is published in uh, both English and Dutch language. This is the content page. 
so the book uh, comprises of uh, projects it comprises of interviews of the uh, of the architects planners and urban designers who were involved in the projects and also essays by professor vinayak bharne so it's a very interesting uh, uh, composition of of the chapters within the book uh in order to buy the book uh, which is also offered at a reduced prices uh, uh, one may visit mylivablecity.com now uh, i'll i'll request the honorable vice chancellor professor nazim akhtar to kindly deliver her address thank you very much ma'am for launching the book mr shyam kandekar professor vinayak bharne professor s m akhtar professor zin hinazia dear ladies and gentlemen a very good morning and also good evening and good afternoon to others who are sitting at different places in the world and uh, for the speakers the two speakers who are at netherlands and in los angeles it's a very awkward time i think now but they are there to be with us and i'm extremely grateful today the launching of the book designing for sustainability through upcycling it's a pleasure for us that it was uh, launched in for india here and uh, it will be i am sure it's going to be a very interesting book very useful book particularly for nowadays practically everybody who is planning for the city or planning for anything should be should have read it i would uh, uh, let the ask the librarian to get a few copies of this in the in library um, in the general library as well as in the architecture and engineering college library and i would also like to read it myself it appears very interesting friends our cities are facing multiple problems as we all know pollution water scarcity health issues adequate infrastructure crime etc inadequate infrastructure and crime etc they are rising simultaneously with the rapidly growing cities and this uh, there appears to be no end to it it will keep on growing with more than half of the global population already urbanized we need to think and rethink how to make our cities sustainable for the future this is particularly important for the developing countries and highly populated countries like india because our problems are many fold when compared to the developed and less populated countries we all know that one of the approaches for sustainability is to practice up where used goods are given new use and their life span is extended this approach considerably reduces the impact on resources and energy and thereby contributing to sustainability it's a matter of immense scholarly contentment that a book on upcycling in cities is authored to bring this revolutionary idea to our urban settlements authors Shyam Kandekar and over 40 years of practice from the Netherlands and Professor Vinayak Bharne from University of South California USA deserve accolades for documenting their projects experiences and understanding in this book which is aptly titled designing for sustainability through upcycling i am very interesting to interested to read the essays by professor bharne because they will be coming from the real life we at jamia understood the need to rethink our cities and urban development many years back and started our mark program in urban regeneration which is uniquely offered in south asia by us Jamia has always been pioneer institution where it comes to when it comes to social and national concerns this memark program which is only 10 years old has trained architects to carry out interventional surgery 
on our cities and make them more livable and habitable. The alumni of this program, our students who have gone out, are now making a difference by working in the agencies which are at the helm of planning and designing of smart cities and master plans in India. I'm also pleased to share with you that one of the recent theses awarded in this MRC program was awarded at Denda Foundation Awards, organized by Institute for Housing and Urban Development Studies at Erasmus University, Netherlands. This book, launched today, is highly relevant for showing directions in attaining sustainability and practice of urban regeneration, not only in India, but other developing countries as well. This book shall be equally beneficial for students and practitioners of architecture and city planning. Most importantly, the book will bring global exposure to students in India. Needless to say that the book has filled a gap that existed in this direction. I finally thank Mr. Khandekar and Professor Varney for coming to Jamia for the book launch and virtually coming to Jamia and sharing their immense knowledge on the subject with their students, faculty members, and practitioners who are present in big number today. I look forward and I sincerely hope that I can invite you again, Professor Varney and uh, Mr. Khandekar, I can invite you in person whenever the pandemic situation permits and long-term association with you in sharing knowledge and experiences. This association can continue, can start and continue even while the COVID is there. Because if you can reach out to us today, we can re reach out to you again and again and again. And we want to make uh, special bonds with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, ma'am, for your kind words, your encouraging words and your insights. Uh, we always look forward to, uh, we always look up to you for inspiration, for motivation. Uh, this event, this India book launch has become very, very special by your presence and uh, by by the honors that you have done to, to this event. Thank you very, very much, ma'am. Uh, with your permission, may I now request that the lecture by uh, by Mr. Shyam Khandekar and Professor Vinaya Gwane be started? Yes, please. And I would also like to attend it. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you for sparing uh, time for us. Please start. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, ladies, uh, Professor Najma Akhtar, Professor Hina Zia, Professor Esam Akhtar, and last but not least, very much to Dr. Nisar Khan, the energy behind putting this thing together. And I'm sure, of course, all the CDOs supported him, but he's a bright young man, and I wish him all the best for running this fantastic program on regeneration. I was really very impressed that Isla uh, Jamia uh, runs this program because not many universities do it. So it's, a, it's really fantastic that you're doing it. Uh, I'm speaking here on behalf of My Livable City, a forum which we set up about seven years back to uh, inspire, inform, and educate on the art and science of livable cities. And this is our second book. Uh, the third book, Streets for All, is in preparation and is coming out towards the end of this year. Uh, can I have the presentation, Nizar, please? Yes, sure. Just launching yeah. it. So this book tells the story of my 30 years of my personal involvement in a large regeneration project in Netherlands. But during that, while I was working on this project, I was also working on projects, other regeneration, projects of regeneration and uh, upcycling, uh, which resulted in sustainability in Netherlands, but also in India. 
And I, uh, it's as much valid while the case study in this particular book is a project, an exemplary project in Netherlands, actually uh, it is important that we realize that also for India, this is as much valid. And uh, I'll show you a couple of case studies which are dealt with very cursorily in the book, but which are also important. Uh, so can I have the next slide, please? Sure. I hope uh, the screen is visible to everyone. Yes, uh, yes it is. Yes. So thank you, uh, Shyam Khandekarji. Uh, over to you. And next slide. So it is about, uh, it's trying to propagate the use of brownfields. People in the in the profession know that brownfield means using that part of the city which has already had has had an urban uh, function and to reuse it instead of trying to get more land from nature and use it for urban purposes. And what it means is, can I have the next one, please? And I would like to start by asking you a few questions and to actually look at, look at these four statements. In our present system of accounting and calculation of costs, a tree has value only after it is cut and made into furniture. This is unfortunately true. You know, we, we, we could all be shaking our head just now that how is this possible? But this is the case. There are lots of trees which are just outside. We don't see them. They're doing, they're doing a fantastic amount of work for this planet, but we don't realize, we don't care about it. They are cut and made into furniture and then they get a price tag on it. Similarly, undisturbed landscape has value only if it becomes buildable ground. The moment you put a floor space index on it, it is buildable, it gets value. And that means that nature and landscape basically is considered free and unlimited. Too, too long we have done that. And I, uh, and I have given a couple of other examples that a, an old forest has only value if it is cut to create a farmland and maybe to create soya, bean, uh, soya beans or whatever. So all these things basically, I know that we as designers and planners and professionals cannot change the system of accounting but we can change our moral compass. So we can look at our cities in a way where we, realizing this, try to reuse those parts of the cities which are not being properly used instead of just extending out at the periphery. That is the easiest way to do, just extend at the periphery. And far too long we have done it. We have done it in Netherlands, we are doing it in India, Whichever city you are in, where you're watching from, just try to think what has happened in the last 20 years. Make a footprint of the city 20 years back and see the footprint now and see where it's going. And it is just amazing how much land we are taking away from farming and nature. Can we have the next one, please? So the central uh, uh, intent of the book is this, that these four schemes, schematic drawings show. The first one on the left tries to show how in pink a, a, a city starts at the edge of the landscape, maybe near a lake or a forest or hills. As the city expands, that is the second sketch, it becomes bigger. It starts eating into the forest, starts to climb up the hill. There are cities in South America, but we also have in the Himalayas places where they climb up into the hill. What you notice is that, at a, in, that is the third drawing, that the forest has vanished because that is easy to get rid of, as it were, for the urban forces. But in the meantime, those are the, there are areas in the city which are decaying, which are not working optimally. The only thing is, it is not too easy to change. It's easier to extend at the edges than to redevelop them because of all the legal issues, because of the ownership issues, because of are the process process issues. So what we are trying to say is that instead of letting the third drawing happen, let's go for the fourth one, whereby you reuse the decayed, underutilized areas and use it more optimally. And I'll give you two examples which we have, where which I have actually personally been responsible for in India. So just so that the contention that this in India may be a more, little more difficult, if you have the right clients, and if you can educate them, you can also get this done in India. So let's go to the next slide, please. 
So I've had the opportunity uh, of 40 years of practicing in which uh, to regenerate quite a few sites in Netherlands, but two in India, which I'll just now show the site slides off. So can we have the next one, please? So the first one, which started about 11 or 12 years back, this was a, a Nirlon Knowledge Park. So it was an old industrial site of nylon yarn, 10 hectares of site, in which two and a half thousand people used to work in the heyday. That factory had closed and we have reused it. And it's a beautifully landscape plan. You will not believe if I tell you the numbers, but, but there's a provision now for 30,000 people, more than 30,000 people working on the same piece of land on which two and a half thousand people are working. And yet it is a park-like atmosphere. And that has been done simply by making the public space the most important part of the design instead of the buildings. In my lecture, I'll keep on coming back to this. I think it's, more impor it's very important that the primacy of the public space is recognized and not the primacy of the building. Buildings will come and go. It's the public space which is the key to a livable city for all. Of them. Okay. So this is these are two photographs on the left side, and the right one is a photograph of the campus. The next one, please. Now this project has been going on for the for the last 11, 10, 11, 12 years. It's reaching the final phase of completion. Yes, next please. The other project which I have been involved in the last five years is an industri old industrial area and the quarters which were related to that of Alembic City in Vadodara. And you see that photograph on the left side. This is how it was about five years back when we started. And parts of that industrial uh, area has lost lots of its function. Now it's very difficult, but we were able to convince the client and we have a very I think a very intelligent client uh, who agreed to do this. At this particular, on the left side, what you see, that whole area has been con converted into a courtyard for cultural and sports activities. So if you look at this left photograph in the middle, you will see a round circle, that's a tank. And you see all these old industrial buildings. And one of these buildings, which is on the right side at the bottom, is a 110 year old building where the factory started. So we have converted that into a museum. And the photograph which you see on the right side is Atul Dodia, the well-known artist, giving a lecture in the courtyard after it has been reconverted and reused. And you can see at the back the silo, one of the silos of the of the building. Can we have the next couple of next photographs, please? Next slide. And here you see that some of the the building has been converted at the museum. But very tellingly, if you look at the two photographs at the bottom, the left photograph shows the situation as it was five years back. The right photograph, the same place today, as it is being used for all sorts of events. Yeah. Can we have the next one, please? Now, uh, and here you see that, that circular uh, tank, which I showed on the aerial photograph on the left side, that has been converted into a podium. And because of that, on the right side, the photograph that on the podium, artists are sitting, they are performing. And in that... It's the interesting thing is that by regeneration and reusing, not only you are achieving environmental goals, but what you are use, doing is you are keeping a part of the history of the city and, and the heritage of the city and keeping it alive for future in a different way, give, reinterpreting. Okay, can we have the next one? Please? Now to the uh, uh, topic. In, I'll quickly go through the so the book contains the case study of Palais Quartier, uh, uh, which is a, an area on the diagram below. If you see in yellow triangle is the old city of Den Bosch, which is a provincial capital. So I think in the Indian context, if you would say you could compare it to something like, I guess, uh, uh, Katak or a city like that, a so provincial capital. And there was a railway line uh, along it, to, next to it. And across the railway line, that area which has been colored red and green, those were the areas which was an old industrial area. That is an industrial area, if we can have the next photograph, which was built. Next slide, please. Yes. It was built in the 1950s, just after the Second World War. Uh, it was built uh, with, uh, for industrial production. 
No, no, please. Can we go back to? Can we go back, please? Yes. So it, it, this is, these are old photographs of 1950s, just after the Second World War. Actually, this particular photograph here on the right side is the Remington Rand Typing fa Factory. So there were all these factories there. And what happened was around the 1980s, the industrial production started decreasing, the service industry started increasing. And this was a dilapidated piece of land owned by different owners. So the city of then Bosque stepped in together with a couple of developers and decided to recycle it. So it was a 30 years back, this is, they started to do it. So they formed a private public-private partnership and they started doing it and they appointed us as designers and uh, with a far-reaching power to uh, envision that area. So then we, uh, can we have the next slide, please? And it was a long journey, but this is a, this is a, uh, a statement which I used uh, quote, which I use very often, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So when you start, it always looks very far away. But once you start, it, it just a marathon runner will tell you that once you start it just there is a certain uh, energy which you get out of it, which carries on. Yes. Please. Next one, please. So if on this photograph across the railway, railway line, that area which you see in that aerial photograph, you can't see it, but it was very dilapidated. And that was the area which needed to be redone. The railway line, the matter of the reason why it was being redone was because the railway line had to be, an extra line had to be added also. So the railway station had to be redone. So these sketches on the right side and a description of this in the book will tell you, these are sketches are my personal sketches actually, which I made as, a, as an urban designer at that time to try to figure out what to do with the railway station and the surrounding areas. Now, this is an important thing which is playing just now in India very much about what to do with the railway station areas because many of them can be actually regenerated in a, and given much better function. Yeah. Can I have the next one, please? So these are photographs of the rail new railway station. I'll not talk too much about it. Can we carry on? Yes, please. Now, the important thing uh, for in design terms of doing something which is going, which you know is going to take 10, 20 or 30 years is not to design the buildings. That might strange, sound very strange, but to design the spaces. And by designing spaces, giving the public space primacy, the prime importance, the streets designing, telling everybody that the streets are going to be good, the squares are going to be good, the parks are going to be good, which are, which are for everybody. You actually retain flexibility for designing the buildings. And the buildings will change as you progress because something you cannot predict what you, functions you would need in another 10 years. It's, it's arrogant to think even that you can do that. Okay. So primacy of space, that is important. In Nirlong, in Varodara, Alembic City, in uh, here. Yes. So then the Palace of, when, when, we, when we were doing this, the Palace of Justice, which was a large building, decided to come there. Nobody knew that they were likely to come there, but only we, when we started doing it, they came and we accommodated it. So the flexibility of design is very important. Yes, please. Now, the sustainability, of course, of this whole thing was being achieved simply by reusing this large piece of land and reusing for many, 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 many more people than during the industrial phase for housing, for workspace, and for recreation. So this is a mixed use development. And here you can see some photographs of it. And important in this was collaborative urbanism. That means that the city also joined hands with the private party. Yes, please. Here we can carry on. And the interesting thing was, and it is these faces are not important, but the interesting thing was that a lot of the people who are pictured here stayed on that project. Some of them city officials, some of them private parties, some of us designers, we stayed on this project for 10, 20, 30 years. So people, if the project was so inspiring that we stayed there. Many of us stayed there. So they have also been interviewed in this book to explain which are the key moments. Because when you have a long development, you can't plan everything. And the interesting thing is to look back and see what were the lessons learned, which were the key moments, where things went wrong or could have gone wrong, where they went right or could have gone better. 
So that book talks also about that in interviews with these people. Yes, please. Next one. Now, uh, the book, uh, the important thing of large-scale master planning and regeneration is that how do you design for something where you can't design everything initially? And many of non-professionals may not find it very interesting, but I'd, I'd like to just spend a minute on it. And actually, that is a very critical document. What do you design when you don't know what the functions exactly are going to be? How do you do it? And this book talks about that also. It tries to explain why you should not be designing in all sorts of details into, about buildings, but it is the public space and connections of public spaces and circulation which you should design and leave the others to come later. This is always very difficult to explain to developers because they want to see buildings, private developers. But the part, the, I think the job of the urban designer planner is to educate them also and explain to them that if you have good public spaces, the value of buildings will also increase, the real estate value will increase. And this has been shown in India also in Nirlong, in the case of Nirlong, uh, which has been now realized. So we can carry on. So this, uh, so then the document explains how the public space was made very important. I'm just trying to look at my time because I don't want to eat into somebody else's time. How much I have? I have 18 minutes. Okay, I'll try to finish another five minutes. Okay, yes, please carry on. This are, you'll, uh, we'll move forward now. Yeah. So the landscaping was done right in the big day. So the landscaping was very important of the public space. Instead of that coming at the end as a makeup, it was, it was created right at the beginning and the buildings came later. Yes, yes. And right in the middle, and, and the phasing was very important. That is also in every regeneration because the existing functions are already working and you have to make the project financially viable. You want the existing functions to carry on going as long as possible. You don't want to have a totally empty site. So how do you phase it and keep new function and old functions? So it's, it's like... It's a, it's a very interesting game to play, much more interesting than a new new design on greenfield development. So designers who think you're restricted, no, this one really reeks more creativity. So it got developed in phases, and then a second pedestrian bridge across railway line got built. Yes, carry on. And the, this, and the project, uh, this how you can carry on. So it discusses how uh, halfway through the process, a new link, pedestrian link, was made to the city. And this pedestrian link is a, is, is a pedestrian bridge, which we have been talking about in India also across the railway line. But this was seen also as a, as a linear park. So I'll show you a couple of photographs. Yes. So we use some of the old buildings, like this building you see, where you see, uh, where you're seeing. It's an old industrial shed, which has been reused. And uh, this is right at the heart of the project. The water, and just carry on, uh, Anissa. And then the guidelines for architecture and how different architects worked on it. So just carry on, please. So in terms of sustainability, yeah, carry on. So the book tries to show which sort of documents you need to create a project which you do not want to design in detail at the beginning. Yes, carry on, please. Now, this water body at the middle, it's a beautiful, it's a central public space, but it's not only looking good. It is, this is only 40 centimeters deep. That pool has been colored black and it works as a solar collector. And we have two layers of parking under it, but basically it uh, works as a heat collector and the, uh, and the heat is then kept in the aquifers many, many, many meters in the ground. And in winter, that heat is recirculated and brought up to heat the buildings. So what is beautiful, this is also one of the sustainability features of this project. So it's a high density project. These curved buildings, yes, carry on, Nisa. Just carry on slowly, yeah. So there you see, so the book also tries to explain what, how this was done. Can we have the next one, please? Uh, and then you have building blocks. I, I don't want to go into the details just now. So. The, the, the book talks about how it tries to create a variety in the building blocks instead of having a monotony of, of just one building, you know. So we wanted to create a city instead of just having a project. Yes, please. Now, each, each block has got 
this green space also inside because they are residential blocks, so people also want to have their own spaces. Yes, please. And, and in, in Netherlands, one of the problem is of, in terms of sustainability is the wind. We have a lot of wind because it's a flat country close to the sea. And these buildings, they are, they are curved to, cre to prevent what we call windfall. So there are all sorts of issues of sustainabilities which are built into the project, uh, which the book also talks about. Yes, please. Ca just carry on, Nisar. So that wa central water body freezes in the middle of winter and is used also for skating. So the public space is kept open for everybody. No. This is that pedestrian bridge I was talking about on the top photograph. And uh, uh, at the bottom, the, the glass portico is basically to prevent the windfall. Yes, please carry on. This is reuse of that old industrial shed building, which I was telling you about. So across the water, you can see that building, those shed, bit, shed blocks, and they have been reused, repurposed, adaptive reuse for restaurants and cafes. Uh, and there is also a, a big shop inside. Yes, please. Can you have the next one? You can now move look quickly through it because it is showing different projects, which, and it tries to, let, just hold on here. It, the, the book also tries to explain how when the program is very complex, which you want to be, make in a mixed use city, how that can sometimes frustrate development. So how do you, which is the trick to separate the program slightly in terms of development, but at the same time have different program in the same block? How do you do it? So it tries to explain also where we failed and had to redo things to get the, the, uh, the function we wanted. Yes, please. This is the pedestrian bridge I was talking about. This photograph on top is on top of the pedestrian bridge. So it's a linear bridge, but basically it's been seen as a linear path. Yes, please. I think now you can move towards the end. Slowly, this is the central water body. Now we're slowly coming towards the end of this project. This is that shed area which is being reused. You can see before the Corona crisis, uh, and every now and then when the projects are, the book also gives exactly how the program was built over the years. So there's a chart which Rice tries to explain in 30 years how slowly residential started, then the offices started, the other mixed use started, the FSI achieved. All sorts of figures are given there. Yes. Uh, and there is a at the end there is a chapter which Vinayak will. Uh, uh, Professor Bhade, with whom I have had great pleasure of teaming up, not only on this book, but on our whole platform of My Liberal City, uh, he will uh, explain this a little better. Yeah. Next one. This is, uh, sorry, can you just go back for a moment, Nisar? So this is uh, where you see much of the project now, uh, where it is, and uh, more than this project, actually, it is the underlying thoughts of how do you do a process like this? How do you design a project like this, uh, which is important? I'll now hand the uh, mic actually to Vinayak uh, so that he can carry this further. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shyam Khandekar. Uh, for showing us the innumerable possibilities that uh, can uh, be taken up in our cities and how to make, in fact, the interesting part, how to make a railway bridge, not just a bridge, but also a park, uh, bringing so many dimensions together. Uh, uh, Professor Bharne, over to you now. Okay. Uh, I do you want to start a presentation? Yes, please. Uh, okay. So... Uh, uh, it's over to you. You can start it at your end. Can you all see my screen? Uh, n not yet. Okay. Yeah, it's getting it's getting visible now. We can see your screen. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay, very we can. good. Well, first of all, thank you to Sham for making me part of this book. You know, he's the mastermind behind this, and I was happy to tag along 
And thank you all for being so generous to launch our book in India. It's very wonderful. And thank you all for joining today. Uh, you know, the good news, just to follow up on what Sham was saying, is we now live in a time when all of these terms, sustainability, upcycling, regeneration, uh, they're not new terms. I think we're teaching about them in schools. I, I doubt if there's anybody sitting in this audience who doesn't know what it means. So that's wonderful. I think we, we've gone past the, the the newness of these terms. But when you see a project like Palascorte had built, actually built and thriving and living and breathing, and you have a person who's sitting among us who sort of stewarded this for over 30 years, I think the wonderful thing is now we have the ability to go behind the scenes and talk about the whole issue of these terminologies, not as theory, but as praxis. What does it actually mean to put these terms into action? And in the process of creating these actions, what are the shortcomings, what are the downfalls, where do we fail, how do you get up and try again, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's the deeper value of a book like this, that it's not a theoretical premise, it's actually based on a fully implemented project that's not only financially successful, but actually tries to do something uh, that, that you know, is administratively difficult and takes a lot of courage because it's not business as usual. So in the same spirit of sort of talking about praxis, what I thought I would do is keep my professor's hat aside for 10 minutes and talk about my involvement in practice in the United States, where in the firm, uh, you know, that I'm involved in, uh, you know, what sort of efforts we've done in similar ways, just to contextualize Palace Quartier and the issue of regeneration and sustainability and upcycling the broader global context. And I'm saying this because, you know, cities across the world uh, are eventually built of the same blocks, buildings, open spaces, infrastructure, everything that Sean spoke so wonderfully about. But the fact is that we live in very different societies. So Netherlands is a very progressive society. Uh, I mean, I had the pleasure of you know, living with, staying with Sham for uh, for the last, uh, I used to visit Sham every year and we used to teach together at Erasmus University uh, on behalf of my livable city. And I got to experience firsthand what an incredibly progressive place Netherlands is. Uh, United States is a bit different. India is very different. Not because, uh, not because uh, they are, uh, they look different, but because they administer differently. The governance is different. The processes are different. The entitlement mechanisms are different. So what this really means is that while designs may be designs, the conduits to getting there are going to be very different. So just a few thoughts from the U.S. Uh, you know, this is the mainstream landscape of the United States. Uh, it's, it's what we call sprawl. All of you know what this means. Uh, but this is a disastrous, toxic landscape. It's happening everywhere in the world in different forms. It's happening in India. It's happening in the Netherlands, too. Uh, but in the U.S., it's ubiquitous. It's, it's really spread like anything. And the scary part is, and I'm going to say this slowly so you can all digest it, at least it scares the heck out of me, is that everything you see in these slides is entirely legal. I just want, you to, I just want to say this again. Everything you see in these slides is not an accident. It is legal which means that it is made through policy, which means that somebody wrote a policy that allows these things to happen by law. We have streets that are inundated with toxic asphalt. We have freeways that are cutting through our neighborhoods. Uh, you know, we have large suburban houses that are mass produced at the expense of the forest that, that, uh, that Sham talked about. We have cars inundating our cities. We have malls surrounded by massive parking lots. So what, in our practice, what we've been doing in the U.S. is we've been making a concerted effort uh, to become a sort of advocates in the spirit that Sham spoke about to challenge these notions, both through design, but also through policy, by working hand in hand with public sector officials. And some projects that, that you know, we've, we've, we've talked about in the spirit of sort of regeneration is one of the most simple things that we've begun to do in the United States is actually attack or rethink what streets can be. Because the most ubiquitous public space in our cities is the street. There are hundreds of thousands of miles of streets that were designed exclusively by traffic engineers for the sole purpose of taking in cars. And you can see the slides on the left. This is a project we did in California about 10 years ago. 
where we took a mile-long street uh, and through the uh, patronage of the city officials, who deserve a lot of credit in every project, even Palace Quartier, you know, you cannot, you need to have stewardship to, to make these things happen from a private sector standpoint. We basically took this street and we planted 400 trees. Uh, you know, we, we just changed this landscape into sort of what we call foresting the city, just bringing uh, trees back, regenerating this entire thing as place. But the beautiful thing is, when we dropped our pens as designers and architects, the city took it over. And while we did the first half, the city did the second half, which has implemented this entire project in eight months. And the result is actually wonderful because what it did is it actually created a place where all the people of different incomes, rich, poor, et cetera, could now stake a claim in, in one space in the city. It gave them a sense of ownership. But because it became such an iconic place, uh, this sort of drab street now began to attract a lot of development, exactly the way it happened in Paris Quartier. You build upon the success of one in the other. And we talk about this in the book in terms of successional urbanism. And the result is the city invested, in this case, in Lancaster, uh, $14 million to make a beautiful street. And it reaped back, in as less as three years, $300 million of economic development investment. And so one of the points we make in this book is that whether it's a project like Wallace Quartier or, you know, the project I'm showing you here, the idea of seeding the first step and then building on success, improvising it every step of the way is not just a design strategy, but also an economic strategy where you can now learn from your mistakes or build upon the economic success of the previous one. Uh, the, the second issue we've had in the U.S., as you all know, is that we have freeways that don't go outside the city, that actually slash through the city. And when a freeway slashes through the city, it fractures cities. This is the city I live in, in California, called Pasadena. Uh, and this is the freeway stub of the 710 freeway. And what happened here is the like-minded citizens, not architects, not planners, just citizens, came together on four weekends. Some of us happened to be planners and architects. And we, we just began to create an activist effort where we brought economists and designers, et cetera, and just through an informal process, created a vision for this freeway and talked about regenerating it as new development. We converted the, the sort of large swath of land into a boulevard, which could carry traffic with the help of our traffic engineers and, and brought in new development to stitch the city back. The beautiful thing is we then appealed to the city council and the freeway has now stopped and the land is being returned to the the city, this project will actually happen in whichever form. This is the second point we make in the book, which is essentially about public participation, that the processes through which our cities are made, uh, you know, if, if participatory, if you can have uh, different like-minded citizens coming together, we, the, it can well tremendous influence. And I think I would love to hear today the efficacy of this in India, because we now are at a crucial time in India where these ideas of participatory planning, etc., cetera, are being talked about. Uh, in, in very cogent ways. The third one that Sham alluded to is transit-oriented development. Paris Quartier essentially is a fantastic example of a large-scale transit-oriented development project. Uh, I mean, in fact, we write about how the catalyst of this project was essentially the presence of the train. It was the presence of the train station that created the first lure for people to realize, wow, you know, you, you need greater access to the station, so let's actually create development around it. And this is nothing but common sense. If you live next to a train, you're incentivized to drive cars less. You live a healthier life. I mean, it just goes on and on. It's a wonderful form of social sustainability. Los Angeles, many of you may not know, until about the 1940s, had a thousand miles of train track. It was one of the most transit-oriented cities on the planet. And, and, and systematically, as the car took over and the, and the cars began to seduce everyone, these freeways were systematically dismantled and replaced with highways. The, the railways were systematically dismantled and replaced with highways. And so what was happening until about 30 years ago or 20 years ago is many of these abandoned railways were lying in shambles with empty lots around them. And when a progressive developer came to us and said, you know, we want you to design one of the first real transit-oriented development projects in Los Angeles. And you see here this sort of dramatic slide of parking lots being dug on either side of an abandoned train track because the city and, and the people, the developers, were not ready to reduce parking ratios next to parking lots. Uh, we now talk about parking you know, ratios being reduced next to train stations, but 20 years ago, 
when this science was nascent in the United States, was very difficult. So here you are, you're, you're, you're digging parking, partly for the commuters, partly for the residents. But nonetheless, one of the first transit-oriented development projects where you, you kept an active, an abandoned train track, you sort of regenerated it, and we designed 350 units of housing right on the train. So you can see the train goes through the block, through here. Uh, this is the original station that you know collected the people in the 1920s. We restored it, made it a restaurant. There's a plaza in the middle, and then five buildings that sort of you know have people live uh, right on the train track. So it's a model, a block scale model of transit oriented development that can be multiplied throughout the city in many ways. Essentially, Paris Quartier is a larger uh, and a much more expansive version of this idea. And then the last thing uh, is, you know, when you think about commerce and what has happened on the retail side of the story, we now live in a world where the lure of indoor shopping is dying. Uh, at least in the U.S., customers are fed up of this kind of post-war suburban mall. Uh, the idea of an air-conditioned mall surrounded by parking lots is now, you know, increasingly recognized as a toxic landscape. And increasingly, there are projects being floated where we are converting these malls, regenerating these enormous sites, upcycling them, giving them greater value, but actually creating walkable downtown districts. So here's the freeway. Here's the here's the the major avenue, and this shows a master plan we just finished for this area where this mall is, is going to be incrementally dissolved and is going to become the new downtown for this post-war city. And obviously, this doesn't happen uh, overnight. It happens over time. So, so it's a 20, 30-year master plan that is exactly what the essence of Palace Quartier is about. Uh, and, and, and finally, the, the, the main point that, that Sham was making is what this book essentially talks about on the broader scale is the wisdom of infill versus sprawl. So we have two choices in expanding our cities fundamentally. We can either do laissez-faire sprawl where the boundaries keep expanding and you eat nature around the city, or you begin to rethink streets, corridors, neighborhoods, districts within the city that keep your nature absolutely intact. So we, we've now begun in the United States over the last 10, 15 years, to engage in entire city-wide regeneration strategies like this one where you, you write enormous policy documents called general plans, which are city-wide policy documents uh, that essentially take urban design on a city-wide scale uh, and, and show where the city could infill and grow and in what capacity uh, over the next 20 to 30 years. And the downtown I just showed you in the previous slide is right there. So you can see that that little master plan emerged out of this project which tells you, you know, how you can house another, uh, you know, thousands of units uh, as, as the city begins to grow. So uh, there are numerous lessons Palace Quartier offers us. So the, my point is the, the idea of sustainability in an environmental, social, economic sense is happening all across the world in, the, in various ways. The beautiful thing about this project is that it's fully implemented now. I mean, it's, and no project is fully implemented. It's largely implemented, I should say. And it's a wonderful project that, you know, teaches us that, 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 that while you can have, while it is important to have a vision that is created by an intelligent master planner, that vision does not remain a frozen document. In fact, Sham and I went back and forth when we were writing the book about how uh, it's important to show people, you know, how constant improvisation has to happen. And, and, and there's an entire sort of uh, chapter at the end of the book that spells out uh, how, you know, different spontaneous decisions had to be taken along the way that kept the original intentions of the master plan, but the details had to change depending on the nuances many times of how the surroundings change, not just the, 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 the wishes of the team itself. So I'll leave you with this thought and we can, we can spark a discussion. Uh, you know, the last chapter of the book, talks, elaborates really on uh, 10 essential takeaways from Palace Quartier. Uh, and I, I just sum them through one sentence each. Sustainability uh, is, is not about buildings. Sustainability is much bigger than buildings. And what this project really talks about is a very intelligent, large-scale sustainability where many buildings come together along with open spaces, infrastructure. And it is the combined synergy of these things 
that generate social, economic, and environmental sustainability together, which is the most intelligent way of understanding sustainability at any scale. The second one is that there are business models involved. I mean, this is not some kind of theoretical project. So it's a large commercial enterprise. There's enormous investment that goes into projects like this. And what that means is you have to have people understand, understand what that means. The beauty of Palace Quartier, which is a unique business model, you can read about it in the book, is it was a public-private partnership, partly with the city, partly with private owners and corporations that formed a unique model, which might work in the Netherlands, might not work in other places. But the point is that it's important to think of all these kind of projects as commercial enterprises, as practical investments that can yield lucrative return of investment rather than just a one-way street. The third, which was delightful to look at, and I'm sure you enjoyed, you know, as you saw Sham's presentation, was just the clarity and effectiveness of design communication, whether it was Sham's own sketches or the wonderful models. I mean, or some, you know, the, the point is when you're an urban designer, uh, drawings and graphics, the stories you tell, the clarity with which you convey them is everything. So because, because as Sham said many times in his presentation, how do you show something that you know is not going to be built overnight? How do you show something that you know even you may not get to design in five or ten years? So giving a certain clarity of an idea without giving too much detail is about balancing effective design communication without showing everything. Then there is the whole balance of predictability versus flexibility. You want certain decisions to be made. If you leave everything uh, open-ended, you're going to get sprawl. If you create too much of doctrine, you're going to get something that will not create the spontaneous environment that we want to. So one of the things we've elaborated in the book about is how, for example, the regulations that were written for this uh, project were intelligent enough to really be very stringent about certain things, particularly the open space network, which I think is, a, is always a wonderful scaffold to talk about master planning. But then the buildings were left relatively open. And so one of the most beautiful things I've admired about Palace Quartier is the diversity of syntax in the buildings. You know, the fact that it's not a development that looks like it was done by one hand. It was really done by many architects, many well-known architects, with a master planner looking over their shoulders and saying, you know, you need to behave yourself, almost like a maestro, uh, sort of telling you when to play the violin, when to stop, et cetera, et cetera. I and mean, that's the real beauty of eventually making cities. And the same thing goes for architectural diversity and compatibility. Uh, any project eventually is best when it synergizes with its surroundings. Uh, some of the best projects I've seen in India done by the most intelligent architects of the last generation. The, the biggest drawback I have observed is that at the end of the day, they remain projects. I mean, I don't have to take names, but the point is in India, I, I, you know, is what we should discuss. It's very difficult, I think, and we should ask ourselves why this is. Did you get wonderful one-off projects by intelligent architects, but they don't amount to sort of relating to anything. I mean, the ultimate uh, idea of a non-synergistic city to me is Dubai. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a unique model because if you go to Dubai, there is, you know, there are utopias of various kinds, the Palm Islands, you know, the Burj Khalifa, so on and so forth. In the middle of this, there's just a, a, a weird sort of thing going through. So they're not connected. So how do you synergize between all these places? It's really a very interesting question. Design improvisation, we talked about this, you know, how, uh, you know, something changes all of a sudden in the surroundings. How do you change the master plan? To what degree do you allow uh, your your regulations to relax, to what degree do you hold the thread, et cetera, et cetera. Sham mentioned team member continuity. I don't have to get into it, but it's very admirable to think that someone of his caliber has been able to, you know, stay with this project for 30 years. I mean, that's a commitment of enormous proportions. Uh, and it's not just a sort of a, it's not just a wonderful thing on his behalf, but also the clients who, who trust a person enough and trust many of the team members enough that you you know keep them over for decades, uh, and and I don't have to tell you when you work for you know ten years you not only become wiser, but you know the mistakes you've done in the past, and so you can improve on them. So consistent design stewardship has been one of the great things about this project. And then finally, uh, Palace Quartier, <laughs> the Sham told me as we were writing this book, is uh, is 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 a name that evolved through a, a, a sort of 
through the auspices of an existing historic palace. So it's, it's a, the appeal of name can never be underestimated. At the end of the day, perception matters, and Palace Quartier did that very well too. So uh, we should discuss all this. Sham is here to answer some questions. I'd love to take some questions if you have any, uh, but please buy the book. We've, it's, it's a labor of love on behalf of us both. And congratulations again to Sham for not just the project, but a great book on it. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Professor Bharne and uh, Mr. Shyam Khandegar for actually showing us the possibilities, innumerable possibilities that uh, that are there in our cities and uh, the way we can actually revive, regenerate our cities, give it back to the people, make it more sustainable. This is immense knowledge that you have actually brought to, to this forum. Uh, we thank you immensely and thank you immensely for authoring the book and uh, which is going to help uh, uh, students as well as practitioners a lot. Uh, Ma'am, uh, with your permission, can we take up uh, a few questions? Uh, Please, yeah. uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I, I have a question. I would want to begin uh, this question as a session. So, uh, uh, Mr. Bharne and Mr. Khandekar, uh, the projects that you have shown actually show uh, the ability of the cities, especially in Europe and as well as in America, to quickly transform, to, to transform and to actually uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, blend or seamlessly uh, blend with the existing cities. Whereas in India, as uh, we are all familiar, that it is only a beginning of such kind of projects. We are still, you know, uh, doing TOD. We are still doing railway station redevelopment. We are beginning, kind of beginning those kind of projects. But still, if we look at some of these projects, they become islands within the city. They do not seamlessly integrate with the city. And somehow... I feel it is. It has something to do with our regulatory mechanism as well as our uh, the way our cities are governed, the way multiple agencies are kind of you know governing different things. So the road is taken care of by some agency, whereas water is taken care of by another agency. Plot is taken care of by another agency. Uh, how do you think you know that our cities or the the governance of our cities can actually be uh, changed or maybe there is a need to change them to actually bring in the change which is more holistic which is more uh, more people oriented which is more uh, human oriented actually so uh, because we often find this uh, it it little difficult to actually implement here can i try to answer that uh, first vinay i'll i'll go ahead Sean. please yeah. go ahead i'll i'll start with the see the I realize very much that with what Vinayak said, that the society in Netherlands is different and in America is different, in, U in India is different, okay? And things are obviously, the governance and the processes are related to that. That is true. Yet, one thing which is common, I, I, I personally believe very much therein, is that if you make public sp the spaces between buildings as the most important part of your communication, your design, and everything. Then you can keep them also open to some extent, even if those projects are islands, okay? Obviously, the issue is inequality in India because of which many develop, many uh, private developers will not want to op open their areas for everybody. And yet, if they have very nice public spaces, which can also give financial returns, or from idealistic point of view, they will do it. I mean, the two clients I work for in India, they were also not, they're private parties wanting to make money. Let me put it straight away. But they are educated, well-intentional people who were willing to accept that by opening up their territory also to others, it will profit themselves also. So in Nirlan, for example, the park which you saw in the middle 30,000 people make use of it. Those people, they work there. But, but, but the main thing of the other thing is not the buildings, but the space in between. And that is approachable from different sites. When you enter the, into the park, you can walk through it. So to make, in Varodhara is probably even a better example. Because this industrial area, which was a closed quarters for everybody, it was just always guarded off. By creating in that industrial area and cultural and a sports hub, 
you get all sorts of activities there where people from the city are welcome and they come. And in fact, it is in the interest of the client to, to get them there. Okay. So I, I realize it is difficult. And yet I think if you make public space the main thing, when I talked about the street, uh, you, so you talk about streets and spaces. So I think I have realized that you talk about in, in India, one of the problems I think in India we have, which I find is that in discussion with clients very often, it is the floor space index and the buildings which dominates the whole thing. If you can convince them that by making great spaces, we can still create, the, give you that floor space index and the buildings will have even more value because of that great spaces. So I think spaces are the linkage, linkages in cities. And then that's that's my quote from Tim. Well, well, first of all, I, I, I completely agree with Sham. I mean, there is no substitute to, to the magic of public space. Uh, you know, I, I, a couple of points. I mean, I must remind everyone in India, you know, I spent the first half of my life in India. Uh, and I've always maintained that, you know, while we often thought of colonial cities as tyrannical, those of us that are post-colonial children need to now just relax and look back to some of the lessons of how post-colonial colonial cities have been sort of adapted. And why is it that colonial cities in India had a completely different place-making idea than sort of the Euclidean ones that came after them? I think this is a very interesting question, which actually I think Sham is answered to, because I think the thrust of the planning uh, was not the building, it was the space between the buildings. So that's one. The second point is the Euclidean regulations, which we imported from the West, essentially, the disastrous effects in all over the world. Essentially, I feel or what we call bylaws in India, or whatever you call them, you call them codes in the United States, uh, have fallen into the bad habit of telling you what to do, but they never tell you what not to do. I, I just want to emphasize this to everyone. What we've realized is the regulations as written, tell you what your setback needs to be, you know, what cars you need, what height you need. But it never has a single thing about what you should not do. You know, you should not turn your back to the neighbor. You should not. It never says this. So it puts a lot of faith in the least common denominator that's out there. And, and this, I think, is the fundamental problem that you should shift. Now, I will say at the risk of being oversimplified, over, over simplistic here, but you know, India is a very different place. You know, is, issues of security alone are enough to, uh, issues of vandalism alone are enough to, to, you know, ask very practical questions that we don't find in the US or, in, or other places. But the point is that there are ways of addressing these consciously. I mean, for example, I've always felt that a simple house in India, bungalow, often has a wall in, in front. I mean, you cannot do it without the wall. But that wall becomes such an important urban element that if every wall starts thinking of itself as a completely different thing, you get a street that doesn't make any sense. If every, if every wall thought of itself as something, all of a sudden you get a beautiful townscape. So how you write regulations, what you accept, and eventually how you create your public space, I think seems to me to be two of the pointers that might begin to talk about how we may begin to forge a change. Okay. Thank Can you I very add much. One more? This is all. Can I add just yeah, yeah, one sure, more thing? sure, please, please. So one of the things about when, when I talked about public space, I and every time I lecture in India, I try to emphasize this, that one of the things which we are unnecessarily doing is le, uh, making the mistakes which West, the developed countries have made. So I, uh, I think it was uh, Professor Hina Zia who said uh, that, you know, we have a disadvantage with respect to the West. I think we have an advantage actually because we can learn from the mistakes. The only thing we should learn from the mistakes. But if you don't, and one of the big mistakes we are making is the infrastructure which we are creating for cars, which we, we just continue to keep on increasing the infrastructure. You know, I mean, I know at this moment the number of fatalities of COVID has increased greatly in India. But you know, every year in India, 150,000 150, people die because of vehicular mobility, 150,000, which is close to, I think, probably what we have lost with COVID. And this happens every year. And many, many more get maimed because of car mobility. 
And these are all young people because in the public space, there are the young people who move there. So the, when I talk about public space, it's public space of pedestrians. So I think pedestrians, pedestrian linkages, public spaces. All half the money which is spent for cars, if is spent only on that, our cities will be so much better. And I think it will be so much more easier to have achieved. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Khandekar and Mr. Bharne. We have a couple of more questions. I think we'll take two more questions. So one is by, uh, I think, Bashali has raised, uh, uh, Banasri has raised a hand. Banasri Banerjee, uh, she's also an uh, alumni of IHS. Uh, Banasri, uh, will you be uh, able to unmute yourself and uh, may I ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we can hear. It was. Uh, uh, it's not uh, really a question, but more in terms of a comment on what's happening in Delhi. Like, for instance, you know, it's a very simple. What you, uh, you know, highlighted is this multiplicity of agencies and, uh, you know, regulations and things. But uh, you know, in very simple ways, change is beginning to happen. For instance, uh, in Lodi Colony, yeah. Just the public art is stimulating a different kind of sensibility, where which is uh, you know inspiring people also then to do something about the public spaces and the space between uh, you know those walls which are so beautifully uh, now painted, and uh, so that's one example. The second is that uh, a number of uh, you know resident welfare organiz uh, associations (RWAs) along with professionals are beginning to uh, look at the spaces within their own colonies. For instance, there's a big movement now in Chitranjan Park, and they had this difficulty that you're talking about, you know, talking with PWD, talking with DDA, talking with the NCD and everybody. Then they got their whole act together and also got in some kind of uh, contributions from these agencies to transform the public spaces, the streets and everything. But uh, of course now things are going slow because of this COVID uh, thing, but um, it's all happening. And then again, you have various examples like Kirki and Meroli and things where uh, you know a lot of uh, action is beginning to happen around regeneration and professionals are involved in it. So I think that's a very positive thing. And uh, uh, even by beginning uh, small and looking at the public rather than the private, and a city like Delhi has a tremendous amount of open space, which you can do various things with, whether it's, uh, you know, urban agriculture or you can uh, do, uh, you know, uh, transform city spaces to make them safer, to make them more beautiful, accessible to people. So I think the possibilities are many. And uh, so let's start working on it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. In fact, uh, you'll be pleased to know that uh, uh, Creative Footprint, which is kind of, uh, uh, you know, run by Mr. Adash Kapoor and Somi Chatterjee, uh, they, are, they have been part of uh, faculty at Urban Regeneration Program. They are also uh, present today's, in today's lecture. And uh, they are making all these differences by taking up this project in uh, in CR Park. And also they are involved highly with the uh, Ministry of Railways in preparation of uh, guidelines for the uh, redevelopment of railway stations that the government of India is doing across the country. In fact, uh, they, are, they have in fact asked a question. So I'll, I'll just read it out, it's in the chat box. So uh, their question is while making form-based codes for railways, which they have recently done, we saw tremendous resilience from all quarters, especially planners. How did you overcome that in your projects? So uh, I think uh, this is a very, very important question. I can go first if you want, Shram. Uh, so yes, you know, in the US, as you know, I'm sure the members of Creative Footprints, you know, we've been very successful in doing what I've now, all of you call form-based codes. We've been doing it for 20 years, at least, if not 30. And we've been at the forefront of doing it, a uh, form like ours as, you know, some of the pioneers that first wrote the form-based codes. But I will say that uh, what I've learned over 20 years of writing form-based codes is 
there is no formula for writing a form-based code. And you have to be very careful on sort of parachuting form-based codes in places where the administration is not ready to even understand what a form-based code is. Essentially, for those of you that don't know what form-based codes are, uh, Euclidean zoning prioritizes uses. It basically says you've got you know, residential zones and the, the well, in a simple way, Euclidean zoning doesn't predict, doesn't create codes that predict urban form. It prioritizes uses. Form-based codes keep the uses, allow a lot of change in the uses, but actually create more predictable form. In other words, like Palace Quartier, which was a very intelligent, without saying it, it was a form-based code, because what it did is it laid the armature, laid the public space, it created a vision, and then that vision became the basis for regulations, which said your buildings have to be this and they can change here. But so it was a form based code in a certain way. So the bottom line is in the US, for example, to answer your question specifically, we have found that the most nuanced science of form based coding is to, first of all, create a vision. The vision has to be there. An urban design vision is the starting point of a form based code. It is not, Euclidean codes do not have visions. They just have numbers associated with FSI. So you have to have an urban design vision. Now, how you translate that vision into predictable form-based codes depends on the situation of how sophisticated and educated and, and used to implementing it the, the people are. If you have a bunch of planners that has no idea what form-based coding is and is not ready to do it, you might want to think of incredibly minimal ways or even tactical ways of implementing that project. If you have a, a bunch of planners that, you know, is, is totally drinking the Kool-Aid and saying, you know, let's do form-based codes, let's completely change the way we're doing it and, you know, be my guest and write the whole thing. I think Sharp should talk about this because what I discovered when I was sort of, you know, talking to him about Palace Quartier is I think Palace Quartier is a hybrid sort of weird sort of record in, in, in the sense that it, it doesn't overdo it, it doesn't underdo it. It lays the open space and it writes just very few regulations that just allow people, just allows the form to be predictable enough, but open-ended enough. And I think that's where I'll, I'll open the door and let Sham continue on this, because that's a very important way of thinking about it, particularly for India. Well, I think uh, 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 Shobhi and others, uh, I, I know you two both uh, and uh, appreciate your work. Uh, uh, I don't know if this is relevant directly to what you're doing regarding the railway lands, but the way the projects, which I have never written a code, which is for a national body or something like this. So I don't know how to do it, to tell you the truth. I've done projects in which codes came about out of a vision, like when I said. And the vision, and this applies to, like I said, this applies as much to India as to Netherlands, in Palaiskoti, but in Nirlon also, we defined actually the public space first. So we, we designed the public space. So we said, if we are going to have, I mean, this is, it's as simple as that. And I, in, whenever I'm on a jury or with students also, I always, and, and when they say that we have to design a thousand housing units. So I said to them, you know, how many people are going to live in that? Do you know? Forget the units, how many people? So let's say maybe there are 4,000 or 5,000, whatever may be the norm. How many of them are going to be children? So you have a number. So can you provide a public space for them? What should that public space look like? So if you, and this is what we did with Nirlong, this is what we did with Palais Kotir. We, based on that, we designed the public spaces and the network. And we said, this is the quality of public space and network we want. And if this is what, and the streets which we want, and this is how we don't want the cars to dominate. This is how we want the pedestrians to be, and they should get more space. This way the trees should come, so the landscaping was up. To allow that, Based on that, we said which heights of buildings we should allow where, what the forms should be, what the uh, public-private relationship should be. So the buildings have to be subservient to the public space, and the code has to evolve from that. You know, it's ridiculous that you can put an con air conditioner at the edge of your building and pump out hot air into the public space in the middle of summer in, in India to tell you the truth. I mean, that, that is encoding should, should not be allowed. You cannot pump out your heat into a public space. 
you should you know do this. so so things like this so uh, i i don't think i think somi and uh, adarsh are busy with something much larger which i can hardly uh, uh, help but this is how i have dealt with it thank you so uh, thank you very much uh, for your answer uh, may i take one more question there are quite a few questions but we are actually uh, yeah, running just, out of time so yeah. just one last question and uh, yeah so uh, one of our students uh, ali khan who's who just uh, done his br and is working in dehradun uh, wants to ask uh, and I'll, i'll just read out his question i recently moved to a beautiful city surrounded by forests and mountains and there are a lot of very established architects over there but it hurts me to say that every one of these are contributing towards a hastened sprawl as gigantic housing and commercial projects that are advertised as heavens amidst wood so something like you know the uh, the suburban uh, development sprawl development in us so what would you suggest to someone as a student with virtually no power nor support to approach organizations or perhaps the government is there any other guidance you would like to impart so we start actually making a difference so it's the it's the typical dilemma that every student of architecture uh, experiences and he wants to bring in a change and finds himself helpless uh, in front of agencies and authorities something to motivate them when i you want to go ahead i'll sure, take this first you know um i uh, i graduated in 1995 so it was not that long ago uh and then uh, i finished my graduate studies in 98 so that was not that long ago sham sham is is goes goes a little before that you know in my generation in india when i look at all the so called heroes that i was told to worship they were very predictable architects i'm just saying this with folded hands because you know they were great architects but i'm i'm just trying to be reverent but at the same time honest about it they were very predictable architects in that they were trained in the west they were sort of bringing in the great kulaid of modern modernism they were flirting around with a lot of beautiful things but essentially they were building designers and occasionally with the exception of one or two of them most of them were not really interested in planning i think they were more interested in doing buildings and Uh, and it always surprised me that while there was an ITPI while there were a lot of planners not a single planner got the voice that many of these so called architectural heroes got i mean and it surprised me it took me a long time to get out of this confusion because as i began to get interested in urban design i asked myself you know for 5 years i've been doing undergraduate studies why was there not a single urban design planning person that i could aspire to and there was nobody there was nobody on the indian scene that was doing work of serious consequence most of their monographs were just filled with buildings so the point is there has been an in- incredible intellectual void and what happened in the west in the 90s when when i went there is there were a lot of people that were consciously challenging this attitude right and 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 from that attitude from that challenge new movements emerged new writings emerged planning and urban design came to the forefront you know people began to criticize the approach to architecture that architects of the capital were giving so what am i really saying whoever you, whatever your name is i think there are a lot of incredible things happening in india right in my opinion for from from sham and i talk every week for for our magazine you know we we you go to facebook you go to uh, to instagram i see incredible stuff happening in india the problem is it is buried under a lot of mainstream bs so what do you do about it as a student what you do is you excavate it and write about it you make it known you know you take all these under the radar quiet little projects that are going on that are really transforming cities in india or transforming places in india and elsewhere you make them really known because it is the only way to have an alternative voice to all the mainstream loud voices that are going on out there it's very easy for architects to be seen because they can build buildings fast it's very difficult for planners and urban designers to tell a lay person or a city what they are trying to do 
So you have to bring beautiful drawings. You have to understand what it is. So as a student, my, my suggestion to you is take an eraser, first of all. I just said this in another lecture at SBA a few weeks ago. You know, take an eraser as a student and blur the boundaries between all the programs in your school. You know, if you're sitting in an architecture program, learn to talk like a planner. If you're sitting in a planning program, learn to talk like an architect. <laughs> B, just don't, don't become a, a siloed, siloed person. The second one is, is go under the radar and take the trouble of bringing the projects that you think are worthy of study and really publish them, write them. Sham started my liberal city and I joined him with my, in my liberal city primarily for this very purpose. We are not an academic publication. We, don't, we do not want to be a, a publication that is so heavy that 1% of the population reads us. We want to be a, a publication that everybody reads because that is the only way you can create bigger awareness of what a city should be. Sham, you will have the final word. Uh, I uh, your dilemma. I think Ali was the name, if I'm not uh, uh, I, I'm just thinking graduated. I come from a very, let, let me tell you, now I'm in a financially comfortable position, but I came from also a very middle-class background. So did Vinayak. And when we graduated, uh, uh, and when I uh, had done my master's, all with my own effort, without bothering my parents about it, in 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 the in UK and uh, Netherlands, and when I came back to India, I needed money as much as any of you. I didn't have family in Delhi or Bombay, so housing was very expensive in those days, and I was living in a Barsati. And at that time, I had a job straight away. I needed a job straight away on getting back because I had no money. And I could get a job with a commercial function, uh, company. I'm not going to name it, name it, uh, reasonably well known, very well known actually. Uh, and I could get a good salary. And I started because I needed money straight away. And within three months, I left that job, not because I didn't need the money. I needed the money very badly. I left the job and I joined another company. And I'll tell you which one. And that one was paying me less. It took, uh, uh, but I joined it because they were doing better work. So one thing I'll tell this boy, I don't know how deep his pockets are, but within all the architects and the planners and companies, possibilities which you have in there, join the one you think is doing the best work. I joined Joseph Allen Stein, who I think is one of the best designers ever India has had, uh, because he designed not only buildings, but the spaces between the buildings and around the buildings. If you look at his campuses. And, and, uh, and uh, so... Uh, I learned tremendous amount from him. And I uh, wrote an article also about him learning from Joseph Allen Stein, uh, sometime back in a book, because that is my uh, respect for him. And so, so, so I'll tell him, join the company which you think you should join, which your heart is saying you should join. And if you can, forget a few hundred rupees, if, if that is the okay. That is the most important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That could not be uh, put up in in any any different in, in any better way. Thank you for uh, that motivation and that guidance at that age, which uh, students need. Uh, we have few more questions, but uh, unfortunately, we are already past our time. Ten minutes we have already uh, crossed. So uh, I'll I'll just apologize to the other participants who have uh, sent us questions. What we'll do, perhaps, we'll send these questions to uh, both uh, Mr. Khandekar and Mr. Bharne, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, you know, send you the answers or replies that we receive. Uh, with uh, Before we close the uh, event, which uh, has been very insightful and very, very informative, may I uh, again request uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, who has been a motivating force to us, uh, Professor Najma Akhtar, to say a uh, final words, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, it was really interesting for me, a person who has no background of architecture. But I stayed back and listened to uh, whatever was being said and also trying to find out how uh, my architecture, uh, faculty of architecture, is going to be influenced by it and how we can use them. Besides, in, in our uh, development, which we are going to do, there will be almost a new Jamia coming up with new spaces and new buildings and other things. So we, I don't and with uh, I don't want an outsider to come and tell us only. Uh, we need an insider, a person with experience 
and we'll definitely be coming back to you also with our um, uh, Professor Bharne and um, Mr. Khandekar to guide us, give us guidance. But the mo most important things will be done by our youngsters and our uh, people from architecture and from civil engineering to tell us where they want to put a big building coming up and how to use the other spaces. Uh, because this is a university of 25,000 students coming together, so we need some spaces where they can um, go around and uh, do meet each other and also get the benefit of being in a green city, green place, because Jamia is one of the, right now, the greenest area, the lung of this area. And the a lung of the city of this area, and therefore we don't want to destroy it. But uh, we have a limited uh, uh, land on which we want to build our dreams in the coming years. Just, uh, just this week, we have finalized that we are going to go ahead with this. The, it's just the arrangement of funds that we have done. We have not, we have not yet started with the with how the building is going to be but uh, i find this very interesting that's why i stayed back and tried to grab to get into it and uh, see how much i i am extremely grateful for professor bharne and mr khandekar for being with us giving us so much time and so much insight and understanding about the work that you have done and how because you have experience not only of of the other countries, but of India also. That makes you uh, more closer to the heart of Jamia. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for your words, final words, and uh, to inform us that Jamia is going to have new buildings. Uh, uh, for the uh, participants, I would just like to inform that Jamia has just completed its 100 years. So uh, 100 years is a long time and now we have to rethink about how to develop our campus and under the motivation and the able guidance of uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, we are very sure that a new inspiring campus is going to come up. Finally, uh, I will request Professor Henazia, our head of the department, to uh, propose vote of thanks. Uh, uh, Ma'am? Uh. Am I audible? Uh, because my broadband yes. is giving me trouble. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am, you are audible. Yeah. It's it's very very fascinating. I would love to have this session going on for uh, another hour or so. Uh, but uh, on behalf of the Department of Architecture, Jami Mil Islamia, my colleagues, friends, team, um, and the entire fraternity, I would say. Uh, on and on my own personal behalf, uh, mm. I extend my very hearty. Uh, Word of thanks to Shyam Khandekarji and uh, Professor Bharne uh, for these very uh, useful insights, narratives which are based out of their own experiences, passions, and for also guiding our students and, and us as professionals also that what should be the focus and, and uh, we many a times face these contradictions as very rightly say, stated by Ali and uh, in, in very simpler terms, but we have our own contradictions often we face. So thank you so much for these uh, Greenfield versus Brownfield, uh, focus on infill development, and most importantly, for bringing back the spaces to the people. Uh, for um, and, and we are very hopeful that in, uh, under the guidance of Professor Najma Akhtar, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, we'll be able uh, to make, uh, because we are in the 100th year, uh, 101st year, and... Uh, uh, while making a new master plan, we will have those insights of bringing back the people in the center uh, of all uh, all kinds of design spaces. Uh, I hope we'll be uh, will be able to do and make make some kind of a difference. Uh, my uh, special gratitude to Professor Najma Akhtar, who, who stayed throughout the uh, presentation in spite of, I know she's, her, her calendar is always busy, uh, also on the weekends, and she's up uh, awake responding to our uh, SOS at 3 a.m. in the morning. She's there. So thank you so much, ma'am, for, for those useful insights and for being with us and always, always inspiring uh, all of us. 
uh, and uh, uh, thank you uh, to all the students for pa- their uh, for patiently listening for their questions and uh, uh, to to everybody uh, from the academic fraternity who is joined from uh, far off places to creative footprints to uh, many of the professors i i can see uh, who have joined who have been associated with jamia for a while and uh, uh, last but not the least uh, uh, dr nisar khan and his team for bringing this chap together uh, and uh, uh, thank you nisar for uh, for your passion for inspiring that passing on that passion to the team who works at jamia uh, specifically for the program on urban built generation uh, so thank you all for being with us uh, thank you professor bharde it must be very uh, late in the night or maybe early hours in in us uh, shyam ji you joined very early in the morning with us uh, very different time zones so uh, again uh, with folded hands gratitude to both of you for joining us today and thank you everybody thank you ma'am for for the uh, for presiding over this and always guiding and inspiring us thank you thank you ma'am uh, now with the permission of the honorable vice chancellor may i request uh, to close the session um, okay please do Thank you very much ma'am. Thank you Nisha. Good night.